that was the heart weight and that was the acetonodal cells and that was the neural and hormonal input. Um, let's come back to our equation here and think about cardiac output again. So cardiac output we said is stroke volume times heart weight. And we've just described the many variables that can influence the heart weight. So we're going to shift the gears here and look at the many variables that can influence stroke volume as well. Okay, so stroke volume is affected by the ventricular contractility. Another way to say that is how hard the contractile cells are working. Uh, the end diastolic volume, the amount that's filled in the ventricle at the end of diastole, and the afterload. Another way to express the afterload is the resistance in the peripheral vessels or arteries that the uh, heart has to work against when it is ejecting blood. And if the afterload is high, that means the heart has to pump blood against more resistance. And so that would certainly affect stroke volume. So these three factors can affect stroke volume and we'll sort of break them out and look at them individually. Okay, let's start with the ventricular contractility, which is the force of contraction that is expelling blood from the ventricles. And so here we wanna remind ourselves that the parasympathetic system has no influence on the ventricular contractile cells. The parasympathetic system only influences the SA nodal and AV nodal cells. So when we look at a variable like contractility, it has no influence from the parasympathetic system, okay? Only the sympathetic system. So the sympathetic system by way of norepinephrine, again, beta-1 cells, again, cyclic AMP and that second messenger system. So similar signaling uh, events, the four results from these events on these types of cells, right? So again, we have two different types of cells here. We're no longer looking at our SA nodal and AV nodal cells. We're now looking at ventricular contractile cells. Um, the events that are brought about on these cells when we engage the sympathetic system are gonna be four. One is to keep the calcium channels open for longer. And for very obvious reasons, that's gonna give us more powerful and steady contractions because now we have more calcium to drive those contractions. <clears throat> and when we talk about this um, stage or this effect, we should recall the plateau phase, right? We talk about the plateau phase or phase two on these cells, which was stalling the repolarization of the membrane potential in order to allow more time for calcium to enter the cell and to bring about more contraction. So this is synchronizing with the plateau phase. The second effect that we bring about with the sympathetic system here is going to be increasing the release of calcium from the SR as well. So not only are we having more calcium coming in from outside the cell, we're having more come uh, in the cytoplasm from the SR. The third effect we bring about is the increase in the myosin ATPase rate. So the myosin ATPase rate is how fast are cross-bridge cycles being formed, which is how fast are those contractions happening. And so that is another thing that increased, increases when we have the sympathetic system uh, increased here. Lastly, we have an increase in the calcium ATPase rate, and that is going to help the cells relax faster right, by pumping more calcium back into the SR, but it's also gonna help the cells contract faster as well. And we've talked about this phenomenon before. If we have increase in the rate of relaxation, then that is gonna likewise result in increase in the rate of contraction, okay? So all four of these effects are brought about when we engage the sympathetic system on these contractile cells of the ventricular myocardium. All right, let's see, we've got a quick question here. So do this, uh, the, the parasympathetic nervous system only affects the SA nodal cells. Does the sympathetic innervate to both these cells and the ventricular cells? Absolutely correct. So the sympathetic system engages both the SA nodal and AV nodal cells and the ventricular myocardial cells. The parasympathetic only um, uh, um, 
uh, stimulates the SA nodal and AV nodal cells. So the sympathetic system affects the contractility and the heart rate. The parasympathetic system only affects the heart rate. All right, very important question. Okay. So let's illustrate those four factors here again. So we talked about this initial sequence of events. When we discussed it earlier, it was on an SA nodal cell. Now we're discussing it here on a ventricular contractile cell. So norepinephrine binds, G stimulatory protein, our amplifier enzyme, cyclic AMP, protein kinase. Those events are the same. However, here on this type of cell, the effect that protein kinase causes are the four effects that we just described. Augmenting the opening of the calcium channels so that we can have more time for calcium to get into these cells. Remember, we said that the source for calcium on contractile cells is not only the SR, but the outside of the cell as well. Augmenting the opening of channels on the SR as well. So we have more calcium coming from both sources because these channels are opened up for longer. Increasing the myosin ATPase rate. So the myosin heads here are working faster at a faster rate to bring about more cross bridge cycles. And then the fourth effect is to increase the calcium ATPase pump so that we can clear the calcium faster so that we can result in a more, another contraction faster as well, right? The faster we can relax, the faster we can contract. So we can dump this back into the SR faster and bring about another contraction very quickly. So all four of these effects are brought about on contractile cells by the sympathetic system. And if we're again comparing the uh, state of these cells at rest, so here's at rest, we have less force generation and that's gonna take us a longer amount of time for these cells to contract. When we have the sympathetic system engaged, we can have more force being generated because of the four mechanisms we just described. And that's gonna take us a shorter amount of time to bring about, right? The sympathetic system increases the force generation and shortens the duration or the rate at which those events occur. And just to remind ourselves here, again, I keep saying this because it's such an important um, concept and not to miss on exams, the parasympathetic system has no influence on the contractile cells. It's little to no influence. And so we do not consider it when we look at the, uh, the stroke volume and the contractility of the heart. All right, hormones we wanna think about. So epinephrine binding to beta one receptors, um, can uh, again have a very small effect, very negligible here, because this is a part of the, I'm sorry, that this is this is incorrect. So the epinephrine binding to beta one receptors is the same effect as the nervous system, right? Just in the hormone um, form. So that is gonna bring about those four effects as well. And then thyroid hormone can also increase contractility just because it helps to increase the overall metabolic weight of cells. As we described in the endocrine system, insulin and glucagon can also increase the heart rate and force of contraction as well. Now let's talk about the changes in stroke volume and how that influences the end diastolic volume. Um, this is gonna bring us to talk about Starling's law of the heart. And this is an example of what we mean by when we talk about intrinsic regulatory factors of the heart. So not only are we looking at external or extrinsic things like neurons and hormones, this is an intrinsic feature of the heart, of the heart muscle and its fibers that can also be used to regulate the end diastolic volume or stroke volume. So because we have increased stretch in the muscle fibers of the heart, that is gonna help these fibers get closer to the optimal length. And so as those fibers stretch, which means that they're, uh, accommodating more volume in that chamber, they're actually going to increase their strength of contraction to eject more of that volume out of the heart, okay? And this is what we refer to as Starling's Law. So when the heart fills more, the fibers stretch more, and they get closer to their optimal length, and then they 
uh, increase more or they exert more tension or more force or they contract harder and that ejects more blood, okay? And I, I just wanna make a note here um, quickly on the difference between the optimal length in cardiac muscle cells or fibers and the optimal length in skeletal muscle fibers. So when you think about the optimal length in skeletal muscle, the, cell, the muscle fibers are usually at their optimal length when they're at rest because they're extended across two bones. And so if they stretch further, they move away from the optimal length and decrease their force generation. If they are more contracted, they move away from the optimal length and decrease um, their force generation as well. But for cardiac muscle cells, when they're at rest, they're not close to their optimal length. The more they stretch, the more closer they get to their optimal length. So the more they stretch, the more force they will generate. So the optimal length is different between cardiac muscle cells and skeletal muscle cells, okay? So this means here that when we fill more into that ventricle and the ventricle stretches more, those cells are gonna contract and generate more force to eject more of that blood out of the chamber. This is why an increase in venous return, which is blood coming back into the atria from the veins, increases the amount that's filled into the ventricle and that stretches the ventricular fibers more, which means it's gonna be more strength of contraction and more force when that blood is ejected, okay? So filling more means ejecting more forcefully and more volume. Okay, so just to um, illustrate that here, here's our stroke volume, the amount that is ejected. Here's our end diastolic volume. Okay, if we have the uh, sarcomere at rest in the cardiac muscles, they're gonna eject less volume, all right? And we're gonna have um, less of that blood leaving the chamber. If we stretch the sarcomere out, which is what happens when the chamber stretches out because there's more volume in it, we now can eject blood more forcefully and we're going to eject more of that. So our stroke volume is going to increase, okay? And then our end diastolic volume is also going to increase, right? We've filled more, now we can eject more, okay? So that is what Starling's law means here for the heart. And just to show that here as well, so here's our initial curve at rest. Here is decreased sympathetic activity, less stroke volume for the same amount filled. And then here's increased sympathetic activity, more stroke volume ejected for the same amount filled. So the heart just works harder with the sympathetic activity than it does when that is decreased. Okay. And then our final factor affecting stroke volume would be uh, preload, which is the amount of filling time. This is gonna also include the atrial pressure and the central venous pressure, which are the pressures that are in the atria and the veins that are coming back to the heart. So those will also affect how much blood comes back into the chamber. The amount of time that it has for filling, the pressure in the atria and the pressure in the veins. And then after load is the pressure in the aorta against which the chamber has to eject, and that will also affect stroke volume. Okay, so that's